Welcome everyone to the second of our Get Togethers, Governing Energy Transition Together seminars. Uh, and I'm really pleased to welcome Jenny Stevens, who's our speaker today. Professor Jenny Stevens has a long series of things I could say about her. She's a director of a, a School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University, and also the Dean's Professor of Sustainability Science and Policy. She's uh, worked in various parts of the US at uh, institutions like Caltech, Harvard, and Clark and Vermont, and has been at Northeastern University now for the past while. This is um, a seminar prompted by her second book. The first one was called uh, Smart Grid Revolution, a co-authored one on electric power struggles that came out at Cambridge University Press in 2015. And uh, the one that's been launched just this year is uh, I, I see that there are other people waiting to get in. Um, is uh, is titled "Diversifying Power: Why We Need Anti-Racist Feminist Leadership on Climate and Energy," and I'm sure that uh, you'll hear more about that from her today. I just want to say about her work, which has been on institutional and cultural innovation in the energy sector for more than a decade now, that it's been hugely influential. It's something that has affected many of us in this field and the field itself has been so rapidly changing over the last few years that I think that this kind of contribution that you've uh, been making Jenny is both really important but also one that it's really nice to be able to discuss with you. So we've uh, circulated or asked people to read in preparation for the seminar one of your papers from last year called Energy Democracy Redistributing Power to the people through renewable transformation. And uh, once you've given us a talk for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I'm sure that there will be lots of scope for questions and discussion, both from uh, students of the Master in Energy and Environment and Society program, as well as from many people who I see are joining us from all over. So over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be able to have this opportunity to, um, you know, virtually come to Stavanger. I have been to the University of Stavanger a couple of times. Um, I've worked with um, Olaf and um, on a couple of collaborations and it's great to have this opportunity to speak with you. I hope everyone can hear me okay and the techn technology is okay. If, if not, please interrupt if, if there's any problems with the technology. It's, it's hard to, you know, we're all, we're all, figuring things out with this, these new formats. So um, thank you very much. It's great to have this chance to, to be here. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I have really focused a lot of my work on science and engineering of climate and energy. And that's kind of the training that I've had, but I've been increasingly throughout my career aware of the lack of or minimal attention and investment and innovation in the social space, social innovations with energy and climate and social change and attention to social justice, which is really critical. Um, so it's great that um, uh, my paper on energy democracy was shared. And what I'd like to do today is talk mostly about this new book that um, was just released. And um, I think it's actually not yet available in Europe, I heard, um, but it should be soon. Um, and um, it is really a focus on diversifying power, why we need anti-racist feminist leadership on climate and energy. And I came to um, write this book. It's, it's, a, it's a non academic, easily accessible book uh, for a general audience of people interested in thinking about how the society is confronting the climate crisis. And I wrote this book really, um, actually I have a, uh, because of kind of culmination of a lot of uh, parts of my own career and some synthesis of, of observations and frustrations that I've, I've had working in climate and energy for, for my whole career, so the past few decades. Um, just to give you a sense of that and why and how this book um, came to be, I, I, I just give a brief overview of my own background. I was born and first lived in Dublin, Ireland, and my family 
uh, moved to the United States when I was um, eight. Um, I studied environmental science and policy in my undergraduate with a focus on water because I had read and heard that you know the next world war was going to be fought over water access. Um, I then did my graduate degrees in at Caltech and really focusing on water and soil chemistry but that led into uh, carbon and carbon management and thinking about elevated carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So then I went back to the Boston area and worked on, did a postdoc at Harvard in the energy technology innovation space. So there I worked with climate and energy experts who were mostly scientists trying to influence policy. Um, then I had a faculty position at Clark University um, uh, for nine years, then I was a professor at University of Vermont for a couple of years, and now the past four years I've been at Northeastern, which is in Boston, um, and it's an innovative university that's uh, really focused on experiential learning and um, and engaged research. So it's a good place uh, and very interdisciplinary. So it's been a good place for me to be. Um, but when, what I wanted to show this background is also just showing that. Um, you know, some many of the people that I've trained with and worked with and um, many of the conferences I've gone to in the energy climate space, I increasingly became have become frustrated and, di and disappointed uh, because I feel like we have been working in this um, frame of climate isolationism, which I, I talk about in the book as a very narrow technocratic way of thinking about the climate crisis and it's based on you know this notion that somehow if we invest in technology we'll have a technological fix and it's based on assumptions of domination and control and I feel like within the climate expert community we've really been missing opportunities for improving the human condition um, and so that's why the premise of the book is that the climate crisis is really a crisis in leadership um, and very explicitly the forces that have been limiting our effectiveness and how we approach climate crisis, the climate crisis have also been uh, perpetuating racial injustices and um, kind of sustaining a conventional traditional status quo systems that haven't been working for most people in the United States at least, but some many of the same um, uh, ideas resonate in other parts of the world as well. So instead of climate isolationism, which is this, you know, a focus always on greenhouse gas emission reductions and decarbonization and carbon pricing and very technocratic framing um, that often minimizes and um, reduces the potential for social change and social innovation. Um, I have put forth that we focus instead, have a different lens, broaden the conversation and be more inclusive um, by focusing instead on energy democracy, which is the idea that we need to move away from fossil fuel based society toward a renewable based society. And as we, that is a major transformation in society. And as we do that, we have all kinds of opportunities um, to invest in people and in communities in new ways that can um, reduce the injustices and inequities that are getting worse and worse. Um, and really base that transformation on social justice and human dignity, leveraging urgency um, for transformation um, in a way that can um, really prioritize an uh, equitable, just, and prosperous future for everyone. So in the United States, um, I want to connect this um, with economic injustice. And, and we don't always think about wealth inequality and um, with the climate crisis, but they're intricately linked. And I think we need to remind people of that more explicitly, more often. Um, so the widening income and wealth gaps, this, this figure shows the United States and it's particularly bad in the United States, but many of the same trends are also in other parts of the world. And globally, this trend is also emerging. So you can see here just in the past uh, four decades, um, the, the share of national income with the top 1% has grown from 10% to 20%. Um, and the lower 50% has declined about the same amount. So um, the wealth is even 
bigger, the gap, um, if you think about actual accumulation of wealth. Um, and that, and when you look at racial disparities within this, it's, it, it's, it's even, even worse. Um, so the, the widening income and wealth gap is very intentional with our national policies. Um, the, the people who have been concentrating wealth and power for decades have been influencing our policies to sustain this pattern so that they can continue to accumulate wealth and power. Um, and they have been very strategically uh, investing to prevent the renewable energy transformation. Um, so in the book, we, I talk about, and others have used this phrase, polluter elite. Um, this 1% who are getting really, really wealthy um, and, and getting a lot of power, they have been strategically investing to resist the renewable energy transformation. They've been doing this in three major strategies. One, many of us are aware of, the misinformation campaign to deny climate science, right? We know there's a lot of research now and we're understanding how much and how successful and how effective these investments have been to confuse people about climate, the science of climate change and to distract us and to also um, uh, question whether or not burning fossil fuels is a negative for society or not. Um, and so that's one strategy. The other two strategies uh, that have been a lot of investment, particularly in the United States, and it's partly why the United States is where we are today, is there's been strategic investments for decades to undermine the public trust in government and to reduce the policies that are designed to protect people. Um, and, and also strategic investment to minimize worker protections and worker rights and the, the strength of unions. And there's really been a corporate culture shift away from thinking about employees and the workers of the company to the shareholders. Everything has prioritized shareholder interests rather than the workers. So um, what I've done in the book is try to elevate the, the, the possibilities and the transformative potential of diversifying power, literally and figuratively. And really by focusing on anti-racist feminist leadership, and I'll explain what I, what I mean by that. Um, anti-racist feminist leadership means leadership that's centered on what people need. Um, a people first approach. It's based on collaboration, inclusivity, and participation. Um, it's based on distributing wealth and power um, and priori prioritizing investments in communities and workers' rights, what people and families need to have um, a, you know, a productive um, and a healthy lifestyle. It, it is focused on reducing inequities and disparities by centering social justice, economic justice, and racial justice. And it's really focused on leveraging transformation by linking the different problems. So rather than thinking about climate change in isolation, connecting the climate crisis with the economic injustices and the growing wealth gap um, with health, the crisis and health access to health um, healthcare in the United States, connecting it to food, access, transportation, housing, all of the things that people wake up every day worrying about and needing. Um, here in the United States, there are a group of um, young junior congresswomen that have been known as the squad. You may have heard of them. Um, they have been the target of President Trump's misogynistic and racist attacks. Uh, and they have been consistently showing up, speaking up, and demonstrating anti-racist feminist leadership and how powerful it can be. They um, have been, they've come on the stage just in the past, the national stage just in the past two years really, and have changed the discourse on climate change, um, connecting it with jobs, with the proposal for the Green New Deal. They've changed the connections with climate, with housing and transportation, um, and they really, it, it's really been inspiring and um, they were really part of the inspiration um, for, for writing this book. And I wanna juxtapose that with more trad traditional patriarchal leadership that is really intentionally excluding people. Um, and it's based on domination and competition and individualistic uh, assumptions about people taking care of themselves. And it's really uh, promoting concentration of wealth and power, exacerbating inequities, and uh, really is 
sustains its power by denying the problems that we have. So not only does the conventional leadership, patriarchal leadership, deny that climate change is a problem, but they also are denying that we have an economic crisis. They're actually denying that the pandemic is that bad right now. They're denying that we have a healthcare crisis in terms of access to healthcare, even before the pandemic. They're denying that we have structural racism. They're denying there's a food crisis and housing insecurity crisis in the United States. So there's so many things that they are denying. And this politics of denial is part of trying to sustain the status quo and resist the transformations that are needed. So um, what I did in the book is kind of go through, elevate inspiring leaders that many of us don't know about. Um, and it's actually a very optimistic book. And um, especially right now in the United States and many parts of the world, um, you know, a lot of people are need some optimism. And I think the, the, the new coalitions, multiracial, intergenerational coalitions that are building in the United States right now and in other parts of the world um, are really inspiring and motivational. And I think we are at the precipice of some big changes. We don't know how it's all going to unfold, but um, we're, we're, you know, a lot of people, a lot of us believe this level of um, suffering and hardship and, you know, getting kind of the worst of the worst, a lot of really bad things going on here um, right now, but it's hopefully a precursor for a larger transformation that's so desperately needed. So um, one of the leaders that I've uh, elevated in the, in the book and talk about is Jackie Patterson, who is uh, the head of the NAACP's Environment on Climate Justice Program. The N NAACP is an organization in the United States that has always uh, um, advocated for and uh, for racial justice and it has a long history, very impactful history. Um, but and their their group has really elevated and revealed a lot of how fossil fuel industry has actually targeted black communities in the United States and manipulated them and co-opted them, um, often even giving them financial support in return for um, political support for investing in additional fossil fuel infrastructure, even while at the same time, there, um, those communities are most at risk for um, uh, environmental exposure, I mean, toxic exposures from the fossil fuel industry. Um, so that has been a very powerful um, example. There's also the, the Koch brothers have been a, a huge part of the polluter elite. And there's an organization led by Jasmine Banks um, called Uncoke My Campus, which is really an organization that helps reveal and resist the influence of the fossil fuel industry in our universities and in our court system and in our criminal justice system, which has been quite influential. Um, and there are um, public sector, this is the, Maura Healy is the attorney general, so like the top uh, lawyer in uh, Massachusetts here where I live, and she's been resisting the ExxonMobil and the power of ExxonMobil in terms of, and, and suing them for, um, um, misinformation. So um, the chapters in the book are about jobs, health, food, transportation, and housing. So I'm just quickly going to go through some of the examples um, and then we can open up to discussion because I'd love to hear, um, you know, reactions and, and have a conversation. Um, a few of the leaders that have been really insp inspirational and effective in connecting the jobs and economic justice with climate energy are Varshini Prakash, who's one of the founders of the Sunrise Movement. The Sunrise Movement is the youth movement, uh, climate movement in the United States that has really um, phenomenal grassroots organizing and collective trainings and very inclusive and collaborative approach, and they have really been um, motivating and mobilizing and having so much power right now uh, because the, the youth in the United States and in many parts of the world are looking around and saying, you know, the future looks bleak, um, not just because of the climate crisis, but the economic future, that the, the economic opportunities uh, for people are really not looking good. So connecting climate with jobs is, is, has been critical. And the Sunrise Movement and Varshini Prakash has been instrumental in collaboration with uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, often known as AOC, um, who, is, who uh, came on the stage and right away uh, 
collaborated to put forth the Green New Deal proposal. Um, so obviously that has been very impactful. And then there's a whole host of other leaders that I mentioned in the book that are really working on job training and making sure that jobs, the jobs related to the renewable energy transformation are, dis are accessible to all and, and even prioritized for people who have been systemically excluded from um, many of the job creation that has happened so far in the renewable energy industry. Um, Grid Alternatives is a national organization that's doing job training for so solar installations in low-income communities. Esteban Kelly is uh, the leader of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, who's working to connect um, worker um, cooperatives with renewable energy. And there's Ruina Altmos is a leader in a, an organization called All In Energy, which works on energy efficiency and making sure the jobs related to energy efficiency are also accessible to people who've been historically excluded from the, from the industry. So all of these people are resisting the precarity of the economic situation. They're reclaiming the, uh, the potential and the need for public investment and really restructuring society for a more inclusive prosperity. Um, then there are um, multiple leaders who have been working to really connect climate energy with health, well-being, and nutritious food for all. Um, Robert Bullard is uh, one of the leaders often considered the father of environmental justice in the United States. He's one of the first researchers to document how the negative health impacts impacts of fossil fuel industry toward in black communities in particular. Uh, Mildred McLean of the Harambee House Citizens for Environmental Justice is uh, often saying, we are sick and tired of being sick and tired, right? Representing these communities that have just been uh, decade after decade, um, not only exposed to more um, negative health uh, exposures, toxic exposures, but then also have limited access to health care in, in response. Uh, Gina McCarthy is one of the, she was the um, uh, head of the EPA under the Obama administration. She's now currently the head of the NRDC and she has been one of the leaders who's been for a long time saying we need to connect climate and health and we need to do it more effectively and energy and health um, and more because that's what people care about a lot and and right now many communities around the world have just recently declared the climate emergency a public health emergency. Um, Jillian Heshaw is a lawyer and advocate for black farmers um, which connects to uh, the nutritious food and thinking about it connecting climate energy with food access. And then we have leaders like Mustafa Santiago Ali, who really is speaking up for black communities and the environmental health disparities of black communities. And Dorsetta Taylor, who was among the first researchers to document how white the environmental movement in the United States has been. Um, it has really historically been a very white um, um, or set of, constituency and because of that has really left out and um, excluded a lot of issues and of, of racial justice. And I mentioned here Jacinda Ardern, the uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand, um, to connect climate and energy leadership with health and well-being. Um, New Zealand, as well as Taiwan, Denmark, Germany, other countries led by women have been among the most effective in controlling the coronavirus and the spread of the, of the, the pandemic. Um, and a lot of, uh, it seems to be part of that approach is the reason for that effectiveness is, you know, looking at the science and the evidence, making strong, uh, distinct decisions that are, uh, and then communicating to people directly with compassion and empathy, why it's not just about their own health and their family's health, but it's actually the health of the community, of the whole country that's at stake. And uh, that kind of a collective communication strategy among a leader that people trust is, is really key. Um, so I also just want to mention uh, transportation, tra clean transportation and thinking about transportation and climate energy is a really important space where we need to, again, move away from this technological uh, uh, focus all the time in the United States, at least so much of the transportation discussions about electric vehicles and Tesla 
uh, vehicles in particular. And you know, those are really not accessible to many, many people. Um, so it's, it ends up perpetuating inequities and excluding people from even considering um, the, the being in, engaged in climate and energy trans, transitions and transformation. So we have leaders like Rep, Representative Ayanna Presley, who's my uh, representative here in Massachusetts, representing me in, in Washington, DC. And she's one of the members of the squad. She has been um, throughout her political career an advocate for um, equi equitable transportation options for people, recognizing how much transportation is connected to economic opportunity. Um, and and uh, she leads the National Caucus on Transportation, which has a justice and equity focus. And Michelle Wu, who is a Boston City Councilor, who has just announced she's gonna be running for mayor in Boston, she has released a Green New Deal for the city of Boston, and part of that is free public transportation for everybody. And you know that kind of an innovation in our traditional sense, people say, how is that ever gonna work? We can't do free transportation. Uh, because the you know the way the conventional budget has been, but when you have an equity and social justice lens, free transportation for everybody is a is a very clear way to open up opportunities and recognizing how the the subway or bus ticket you know is a regressive uh, uh, instrument because for people who are struggling that costs the same as somebody who has a very high income and it's really a, a, a limiting factor so often. I will mention here also Greta Thunberg who obviously went with her um, coming over to North America last year um, by resisting taking an airplane and finding you know uh, finding boat options, sailing options to cross the Atlantic both ways. She also elevated this connection with transportation in an innovative way. Um, housing is another um, key area that has so much potential to connect with climate and energy. And we see some leaders like Representative Ilhan Omar. She's also one of the members of the squad who is connecting, acknowledging we have so much housing insecurity in the United States that, and with the pandemic, it's just increasing. We have thousands and, and potentially millions of people about to be evicted from their homes and no plan for where those people and those families are gonna go. Um, so we need major investment in housing um, and connecting that with climate energy and efficient housing options um, is, is key. Um, just a quick example of other innovative leaders. Um, there's a group called Moms for Housing, which were four homeless women, mothers, who occupied a vacant house in um, Oakland, California. And they didn't, they, it, there are a lot of vacant homes in Oakland uh, with developers uh, waiting for people to buy these um, homes. At the same time, there's so many people that have no homes to live in. So these women came in and occupied a house. Um, and then when they were evicted, um, they actually sent a, um, uh, you can see here this military, including uh, tanks with with guns, to evict these women. Um, and in response to that whole episode, they have elevated the idea of housing as a basic human right, and um, that's something that the United States has not embraced. Um, and and we see increasing homeless um, um, settlements all over in many of our all of our cities. And there's there, it's a real real problem, and we need big public investment in housing. And the final example here is an indigenous uh, women in Canada that I wanted to mention, the tiny house warriors who have um, embraced the, their commitment to thinking about the land as their home and resisting the trans regional pipeline, um, which is a fossil fuel pipeline by building these uh, tiny houses on wheels that they can move to block the building of the, of the pipeline. Um, and that's an exa another example of a, a new approach, innovative, creative way to resist uh, the fossil fuel uh, powers that be. So I wanna end here um, just with um, some uh, final notes. The, the last chapter of the book is really about our collective power for transformation and how we can all um, get involved and, and lead to act and act to inspire new leaders. A lot of this is really about um, uh, not just elected officials, but all of us are leaders in our communities, in our families, in our the organizations or the universities that we work with or are part of. 
Um, and we all have opportunities to advocate for bigger systems change, to understand and unlearn racism and sexism. Um, in the United States, we have a lot of voter suppression going on. So just in the next weeks, many of us are focused on making sure that people are able to vote and helping other people to vote and uh, connecting with our elected officials to make sure that um, democracy is, is, is maintained. Um, obviously, there's lots of opportunities to uh, acknowledge and prioritize diversity, equity, inclusion everywhere. One thing I want to encourage people that if you're just um, in the United States, you know, if we're, when you don't acknowledge the systemic racism and sexism, and you just continue on doing what you're doing, you are actually perpetuating it. Um, so we all need to really be all the time reminding ourselves to acknowledge and act in ways that um, resist the typical way we do things, because so many of the ways we do things are uh, perpetuating and exacerbating inequities. Um, so there's other opportunities, obviously, for engaging in local community renewable energy, leveraging data and science for change, and supporting cooperatives and new economic models. Uh, we, we increasingly do have, um, especially in the United States right now, this big divide, uh, a political divide, and Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, has really uh, focused on elevating you know, a people's first approach. So if you focus on what people need um, and what families need, what communities need, it, it, you, you, you hope that wouldn't be as politically divisive as it has been. And I'll end also just by um, honoring uh, Shirley Chisholm, who is, was the first black woman to run for president in 1972. And so in some ways we've come a long way since then. And in other ways, we really have not come a long way. So there's, um, uh, she has given inspiration to so many people um, who are now, uh, seeing seeing opportunities and and getting involved in in new in new ways so i'll end there and i will just mention uh before i end that my book uh, all author proceeds from this book will are going to the naacp's environmental and climate justice program um, which is a program that particularly emphasizes the black community and uh, supports um, uh, acknowledgement of the environmental and climate injustices that are directly related to systemic racism in the United States. So I will end there and um, let's see, stop sharing, and I'd be happy to um, yeah have a have a conversation. Great, thank you, Jenny. That's terrific. Um, I'll just say, for the sake of logistics, that. Um, anyone is welcome to switch on their video and audio and ask a question if you're you will be recorded if you do so if you're uncomfortable with that you're free to type in a question to Jenny in the chat and I can read it out or she can read it out and take it as well. Yeah, so I guess maybe if uh, to spur some questions. Um, if or unless maybe there are questions, but I was going to say one one additional thing that I think is really important. Um, in the book, when I talk about diversifying power, it's not it's it's too, it's actually two pronged. One is actually representation of people, like have, letting women and people of color and indigenous folks who've been historically excluded be um, come you know come to places of decision making and policy making and bring their background and that is really really important the other the second part is um, that everybody um, including men and and uh, people of every ethnic and racial and socioeconomic and religious um, background uh, can embrace anti-racist feminist principles um, and i think too often in the united states at least you know, it's been um, not enough white people have been emphasizing anti-racist principles and not enough men have been emphasizing feminist principles. So I really uh, encourage, and, and that's kind of a, also a goal of the book, to um, move beyond the identity politics and, and focus on both uh, how diversity is critical for innovation, right? Um, 
and we make much better decisions when we have lots of different perspectives included, and that these principles of anti-racist feminist perspective can be embraced by everybody. Um, so I just wanted to add that piece. sense from teaching is that people sometimes need a few seconds to to gather their thoughts and compose a question so I, I i'm very tempted to ask one while while people are busy doing that which is that you have these uh, this terrific selection of leaders community leaders people who've done inspirational work um and and you've talked about the vision of being able to you know have role models to follow and being able to share those inspiring stories as ways of enabling others to to emulate um one of the one of the kind of questions following on from that for me is what about those who are unable to act are there forms in which local leadership or more than local leadership is inhibited that you came across when looking into these stories when talking with these people is it possible that there are structural kinds of there are of course many kinds of structural barriers but particular ones that they've somehow been able to overcome um if you were to theorize that uh, in in a more conceptual piece what are some of the kind of integrative pickings you would take from having worked on so many different uh, examples yes yeah, so a great question and i would say that almost everybody that um i talk about in the book and that i talk to in writing the book um, has faced, you know, attacks, um, resistance, uh, you know, setbacks and structural, personal um, and political, right? Um, and I think one of the things theoretically what we can understand, you know, those of us who've, who've thought about kind of the theory between transformation, how trans transitions happen, if you think about the socio-technical systems, right, that, that we sometimes theorize about, um we can expect i think it helps to know that the theory tells us we should expect resistance right we should expect the people who are currently in power to denigrate us and dismiss our perspective and resist the transition and the transformations that we're calling for um so if you if you understand that from the theory you can interpret the attacks or the systemic barriers that you come up against um as perfectly anticipated and expected like that's of course people are going to um re react in that way so i think that's very helpful um and that's where you know i when i talk with many of my students who are involved in different ways um you we should expect and not be surprised uh by some of that and um you know it's it doesn't make it easier or pleasant uh especially when um you know it, Obviously, in this country, the political discourse is just getting worse and worse in terms of any form of mutual respect and, you know, personal attacks are are being happening more and more. Um, so we don't, con you never want to condone or accept that. And so calling people out and saying, you know, that's inappropriate, um, but then moving on and dem and looking forward and not letting it um, get you down, <laughs> I guess. Um, so. But it's hard, uh, especially with bigger structural issues where, where so many people have been intentionally for ex excluded and are not accustomed to and don't even don't know how to um, uh, um, that most effectively exert the power that they have. Uh, thanks, Jenny. If you don't mind, I, I, I have uh, a, you know, a couple of thoughts or questions. Uh, yeah, I appreciated the talk. And I, I haven't read your book yet, but I, I just got it while I was listening to you. So I'm looking forward to, to, uh, to giving it a read. Um, I'm wondering, I, I guess, a couple things. Um, everything revolves around COVID these days. It sort of sucks the air out of the room. So I, I, in that way, I, I think the timing with your book, you sort of wrote it and then COVID happened and all this, uh, everything changed. I'm wondering, um, if, if, if there's any lessons that you've kind of garnered from that as, as it sort of connects to the book. Um, and then again, I, I actually haven't read your book. So I'm wondering what um, 
policies you would sort of uh, recommend moving forward? It was very, sort of very high level um, uh, w w from listening to your discussion, which is nice. Um, but what, what sort of like specific uh, policies uh, would you sort of suggest to our, uh, to our leaders um, in the States? Um, I come from Canada, so maybe a, a bit of an international perspective. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And um, um, yeah, with COVID, what's, what I, what's been happening as far as I can see is that it's really just revealing so many things that many of us have been worried about and noticing in terms of the systemic, uh, you know, denial of problems and the um, in growing inequities and disparities that we're seeing. Um, unfortunately, I mean, COVID has just revealed that to everybody. Everyone now sees like, oh, wait, um, you know, we didn't realize this many people didn't have access to healthcare or this many people um, are um, really struggling economically uh, and that our, our support systems are not able to provide um, um, sufficient um, help to people. So I think uh, what what's the, the pandemic has really um, elevated the interconnectedness of these issues, I think. And, um, you know, the uh, concern, particularly in the United States, about racial injustices has been there, you know, for for hundreds of years, right? Um, since the the the, be the beginning of the, the country, the United States, and yet um, the outrage this summer um, was different in part because of the pandemic, because um, people were um, are more focused on basics, right? We're back to basics where we've been locked in. We've been thinking about what is the ba what are the most important things that we need right now? How can we keep ourselves and our families and our communities healthy and safe? Um, and, and then seeing that everybody is struggling with the same, you know, a similar challenge that's, and um, it, it really kind of created a time when people had more time to be reflective about what is our society doing? What direction are we going? Why do we have, why do these countries that have invested so much in the science and technology, and we knew about the climate crisis, we knew there was gonna be a pandemic. We, like the, it was all projected and, we, and we've done research to know how to effectively manage it, yet we somehow are unable incapable of actually doing it, implementing it. And why is that? And, and so I think it's really revealed a lot and it's made people uh, a, a greater awareness of the interconnectedness of these issues. In terms of specific policies, um, you know, I think in the Green New Deal is the platform that isn't a specific policy. The French, there can be lots of um, different policies within, within it, but it's really focused on investing public, inc huge, massive increases in public investment, um, which again, the pandemic has demonstrated we need. If we, there's no business as usual, if, if we continuing, like it didn't work, it doesn't work. Um, we're gonna have increasing, uh, you know, really um, catastrophic situations that are already there and they're just getting worse and worse day by day here in the United States and, and in other parts of the world. So we need big public investments and they're gonna, they're gonna have to come um, even if there's a big delay. It, and the question for all of us and for every area of public investment is to make sure that those public investments go to the people who need them most and don't go to the corporate um, interest because that's what's happened even with the our initial COVID um, relief package that was supposed to go to people who needed it. All, many companies were able to come in and figure out a loophole where they were able to take uh, some of many of those public funds and the, some of the public funds didn't go to the people who need it most. So it really matters, not just the level of public investment, but how those policies and those public investments are distributed to make sure that we actually prioritize the people who need um, the help the most. See, Lucy has a hand up. Lucy Middlemiss. Hello, um, I'm joining you from West Yorkshire. <laughs> I'm outside, so forgive the traffic noise. I'm having a walking seminar, so I've listened to your seminar while 
looking at the lovely West Yorkshire countryside. <laughs> it was very inspiring. Thank you very much. So two things I took from it, and one of them is to do with anti-racist feminist leadership. And I think a, a sort of positive reflection on that is that I can really see that in my university. I can see a lot of uh, that kind of, those kind of ideas being mobilized in terms of the way that we, we run our university. And I think um, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading your book to find out how you characterize that. Um, the other thing was um, around the sort of nature of the, the, the sort of new, this new discourse around environmentalism, which is anti-racist and feminist. And I, I really would be interested to hear your thoughts on, so the, the way that you've described it is kind of as a, a, as a living discourse out there that has emerged. And I really can see this as the one that's been involved in this area for quite a while. Um, do, do you think it's it, uh, it the, what, the discourse you're describing it feels quite us oriented can you see uh national differences can you see um uh variations in different places and um, and if so what are they um it, yeah that's kind of where where I'd, li I'd like to finish great well lucy thank you for joining and i'm glad you were able to uh multitask and go for a walk while listening. That's great. I did that yesterday with another seminar. So I, I think it's a great, a great approach. Some of the benefits of, you know, the different modalities where we can uh, take advantage of, of some of these opportunities in different ways. Um, yeah, so thank you for your comment about the emergence of and the continuing evolution of anti-racist feminist leadership. It's great to hear that you've noticed it or, or seen it in other contexts, including university leadership. Um, I have not seen it in my university <laughs> leadership, um, but that you know it's a working a work in progress. And as you said, so many things are changing right now, and things are changing pretty quickly. And um, people are open to. Uh, we're in a very disruptive time, right? And so people are realizing, learning new things that they didn't notice before, uh, particularly people who haven't been as aware with some of the systemic connections and linkages between all of these issues. So um, I, I, it's, it's, I think it, I think it is, um, you know, um, timely in that, and it's great to hear that you're seeing that emerge in other contexts as well. In terms of um, how this is evolving in different places, um, I, you know, I have limited perspective uh, because I have been uh, very much immersed in the United States um, re most recently, particularly in the last um, uh, six months or so um, since the pandemic. Um, but I, I. I mean, I have a general sense that a lot of the um, that maybe the United States is is a I don't know what the right word is uh, kind of reflective of or an exa example of the culmination of all of problems that are in lots of other places as well and that maybe things are worse right now in the united states and we've gone farther on a lot of the this um these trends and it's coming together in a way that i know um you know people outside the united states that i've talked to are kind of surprised and shocked and and um so so maybe the rest of other people can learn from how bad things have gotten and why they have in the United States. Um, I do get a sense, you know, that other parts of the world, particularly Europe, um, and I do have, you know, I am actually EU citizen. Um, um, so I have connections in, in family, personal and professional connections in Europe. Um, I, that, you know, there is some level of a, of a higher level of compassion, um, and valuing of of life in in a um, in a deeper or not, I don't know exactly the right way to say that, but um, I I know that our um, actually I was on a panel yesterday and one of the speakers said you know our policies reflect our values and our budgets also reflect our values. Um, so if you think about that, in, in the United States, um, we have had 
um, really disastrous policies for a very long time um, at the national level and at, at state and some local level that have really not been working for so many people. So that's part of why this um, growing inequities. I, I hope and I think that in some other places, um, some of that those values are stronger and maybe the policies are stronger and, and maybe the um, budgets are stronger in certain areas that have, have been intentionally and strategically minimized um, in the United States. Again, I, I, I you know, have limited perspective, uh, but I do think there are some similarities and I know a lot of the things that have happened in the United States, you can see happening in other places for sure. Um, but maybe not to the same degree. Um, and maybe there's more time to um, rectify um, some of that. Um, but at the same time, you know, a lot of places um, have a very long history of uh, oppression of different uh, constituents and um, in some ways, you know, other other places are more traditional and conventional. Um, so there's there's different different opportunities, I think, for this kind of uh, emerging leadership um, in different places. So that's a kind of general answer, Lucy. Um, but I very much appreciate the question, and I'm sure I'd be, it'd be great to hear others' um, thoughts on that, uh, particularly. Um, in Norway, I don't know the Norwegian context much, um, but I'd be curious to hear any 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 other thoughts on that. Wonder if there's any more questions coming. Usually we'd have um, a room full of students. We've had a, a strike in the public transit in several cities in Norway over the past week, and it's only just resumed, but we couldn't have a gathering on campus today, which is also why you can't show you a room with people, which is a shame, but, uh, but it will be recorded and posted afterwards as well. Um, just to, I, I think, to pick up on your thought there about uh, university leaderships and their response as, and to what extent that echoes um, and embodies similar kinds of principles or lack of them as national responses. Um, it, one, of the, one of the things that's really struck me with, with the pandemic and, and responses is um, the kinds of demands it imposes on labor, um, how that spread distributed across both sort of uh, faculty and those who have the burden of uh, running the kinds of activities that universities are for, but also on students in terms of what we demand of, of people's attention and ways of being, ways of learning. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that there's kind of a, a bit of a stretch as a question, but whether there's something we can take away from there with what it takes to actually govern different kinds of low carbon transitions that we have a few people with a lot of power who are supposed to do a lot. And you've talked about the ways in which it can be unequal, um, inequitable, but are they also just sheer sort of the burden of what people need to do? Some of the leaders that you've talked about, everything that they need to move isn't, does that in a sense overwhelm the kind of capacity that even very willing people in power might have within structural limits? Yeah, so I, I think I, I understand the, the question there. Um, I guess I would say that a couple of things. One is part of the impetus for writing this book and one of the points I was trying to make is that the conventional policy approaches for climate have clearly been ineffective, right? Like we haven't made much progress. We are not moving in the right direction really uh, sufficiently at all. Like we've been in, insufficient um, and part of the argument is that the reason that has been ineffective 
is is not because well is because the we we don't have the right people involved in designing what we should be doing right we haven't been it's been very exclusive it's been a limited set of people who have been coming up with ideas um you know very uh often looking to scientists who don't know um how the how the social part of the world works um um to suggest policies right that um are often out of touch with uh, what what's going on on the in a lot of communities um so i think that is part of the the idea here so it means i guess you, you would ask about leadership and kind of the burden of leadership and who's um you know is it too much for people to take on um and i think the the real message is that climate and energy policy has to be integrated into every other policy right it's not we shouldn't have actually um uh you know obviously we need some separate climate energy policies and the way policies are organized that's the way um they there will be but really the point is that our health policy our economic policies our uh, housing policies our educational policies need to acknowledge and integrate um the the what's happening with climate change and then what's happening with our energy system into everything so that uh, to to ensure that we can make the transformation so if that i, I think that kind of speaks to uh, part of what at least part of what you are what you are asking and i guess i would also just say um with regard to universities um um are again in in different countries we have more public universities and more private universities in the united states a lot of universities have, are also private um, and so the public investment in universities um, has been declining um, as part of this uh, larger um, disinvestment in, in the public good um, for private interests and so that is something that and again i don't know the finances of university um, uh, structures in in other countries that much i mean i've you know i know some anecdotally here and there but i i um that is another piece that i think is is a difference uh, maybe with the united states um in the prevalence of all of these private um universities that are part of uh you know that might that have motivations that are um very much within the capitalist system and they don't necessarily be aren't necessarily prioritizing you know knowledge creation and um education for the public good i mean yeah so thanks jenny i think issues that are very much on on all of our minds i um, i think we have time for one burning question if anybody has one that they'd like to squeeze in here. I see that Lucy mentioned um, checking out uh, on Twitter, Black in Geosciences, celebrating Black scientists in environmental fields. Um, so thank you for that, Lucy. Um, and, I mean, and part of, there is a part of this discussion that is very much, uh, critiquing how ex exclusive and elitist science has 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 become or maybe always has been um but that is um you know not it's a many of us um, um many people don't have access to good science education and then therefore, therefore they're excluded from the, the whole scientific discourse and and that has also contributed to being excluded from thinking about um climate the climate crisis in in kind of a engaging and an inclusive way so um that's a very another additional point so thank you lucy for mentioning the um th that organization or that twitter feed thank you jenny i i think i will say thank you both for joining us today taking the time um to share your work and also for the work itself i think the the one of the points you made towards closing about the need to integrate an agenda across all sectors and really make it uh, make the transition about 
social justice in in many ways that we should be working at anyway that's something that um it, it seems like a simple thing to say and <laughs> and you've talked about how and i'm sure the book shows how it is incredibly difficult both politically and uh, and practically um so there's work ahead yes thank you so much it was great to have this opportunity and uh Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks for being here. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Bye for now.